You are listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, where we believe the Bible is sufficient and answers life's problems. I'm your host, Pastor Jeff Christensen. This podcast is for everyone in the body of Christ, staff pastor, church leader, caring homemaker, the responsible businessman, everybody. But it's also for my Calvary Chapel University students. Shout out, hello to you guys. All of us are called to offer counsel regularly. And we every day need a word of counsel from the Lord. So these episodes are designed to assist you in learning to give godly counsel. Also to develop discernment in evaluating counsel that you receive. So it's my prayer that these podcasts, that these episodes will enlarge your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a wonderful counselor. God bless you. Grab your Bibles. Let's get started. See you on the inside. Welcome back to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. My name is Jeff Christensen. I'm your host today. This study is the place of eschatology in the counseling arena. So number one, as a biblical counselor, you want to have a conviction or a clarity on your position of the end times. What do you believe about the book of Revelation? What do you believe about predictive prophecy? What do you believe about the rapture? How does that affect biblical counseling? How does that affect how you talk to those that are struggling or thinking about their future? You're a guidance counselor or you're dealing with people that are struggling internally or having conflict resolution matters or interpersonal relationship or premarital counseling or marriage counseling, whatever type of counseling you find yourself in, addictions, so on and so forth. Maybe you're guiding somebody for career counseling. Maybe you're uh, guiding somebody in in their um, education or whatever it might be. Eschatology, the study of end times, has an important role to play. Now, within the biblical counseling movement, There isn't a lot written on this subject, and let me tell you why. Let me just be forthright. I know you understand I'm forthright, okay? You already know that, but most biblical counseling arenas are reformed in their their thinking, and oftentimes, not always, but often, eschatology and end times in the book of Revelation do not play a part in the biblical counseling arena. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's short-sighted. But that's because a lot of people don't have the conviction that you and I might have. I consider it a second-tier doctrine, the rapture of the church. A lot of people will put it in third or fourth tier. What do I mean by uh, tiers of doctrine. First tier is salvific. You must believe in the deity of Christ to be saved. You must believe in, you know, things such as the authority of Scripture, or the, uh, the virgin birth, or those doctrines that are salvific in nature. Second tier matters are, we can still fellowship, but we tend to have our ministries divided, whether uh, whether denominationally or locally or ministry-wise. We kind of say, hey, we love you, but we believe in total immersion for baptism. We don't believe in infant baptism. So that's why you have the Presbyterians versus the Baptist. A whole denomination is named after the mode of baptism there. And we're not going to have a denomination named like, you know, the Church of the First Church of the Rapture, but nevertheless, we put it in a second tier doctrine. Some will pop it down to third tier, other types of doctrine. So you do theological triage and decide where is the doctrine in your tradition or in your mind. And I would say the rapture of the church is second tier doctrine. And here's why because we look at the culture today, we look at what's going on in the world today, and I think we're living. In a time, the times of the signs, some would say the signs of the times. And often people will scoff at that. Oh, give me a break. I've heard this before. They've been saying Jesus is coming forever and nothing has really changed. I say, really? 
A lot of things have changed. I believe we are living in the last days. In the last days, Timothy said, perilous times will come. People will be, men will be, women will be lovers of themselves. And then he lists a whole lot of self-love, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, lovers of self rather than lovers of God. All of those things are happening all around us. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, what things? Well, the stage being set, but more than the stage being set, I think Armageddon or the Antichrist or things that are happening in the seven-year period of tribulation are casting the shadow, and we are seeing the outline, the, the shadow of the substance about what's to come. The Bible gives us clarity on the future, and in this podcast, I'm going to share my conviction that the next event on the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, what are we to do? We're to look up. Look up. Why? Our redemption draws near. What does that mean? It means to look to heaven and be reminded of this. God is control. God is in control. And we're to look up. And so when we minister to people, when we minister, when we care for the soul of another, when we're doing soul care, soul work, when we're working with people spiritually and with their souls, we want to remind them to look up because because we need this in the day we're living in. We need to know what's happening around us and in our world and as things are unfolding. And it can be scary and confusing. And yet the book of Revelation and a lot of other uh, uh, predictive prophecy in the scripture, there is a study of end times that we are, we are wanting to bring into the counseling office, a study called eschatology. And a lot of people will say, well, you really can't understand it. It's all too complex. But yet Jesus said, or the Bible says, we should know these matters. In, in, the, in fact, in Daniel the prophet, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, he says, let the reader understand. And I think that's interesting. He's talking about the prophetic event that's still future. And Jesus says, to you, to me, let the reader understand. We're to understand predictive prophecy. And why would he say it unless we're able to understand it? You know, revelation, it's not revelations, plural, it's revelation. It's the unveiling, the revealing of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in his full glory in the last days. We are seeing it unfold before our, uh, our eyes when we read the book of Revelation. It's an unfolding, it's an unveiling. It's God's desire to reveal, revelation, to reveal, not to conceal, to put it in plain view, not to hide us, not to hide it from us. And so people do not have to be afraid of the topic of the book of Revelation, predictive prophecy, the wrath of God that's to be poured out on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. We don't have to be scared of it. These hard truths about God's wrath are not in the Bible to scare us, but to prepare us. And I'm going to look at that in the counseling office. I think it's important that these hard truths about God's wrath to be poured out in these tribulation days that they're in the Bible, not to scare us, but to prepare us. And there's a special blessing in the counseling arena. When you're in the revelation teaches us, there's a special blessing promised to the person who reads the things in the book, hears the things that are in the book and keeps the things that are in the book. Blessed is he who reads and hears the word of this prophecy and keeps the things in it because the time is near. I am really just, I, I don't, I'm taken aback at the short sightedness in the biblical counseling movement not to bring to bear the truth of this prophetic word of the rapture of the church, the return of Jesus Christ, the blessed hope that he will come for us in the rapture 
seven years in heaven during the tribulation. We're not appointed to wrath. And then the second coming of Jesus Christ, where we come to rule and reign with him during the millennial reign. I think it's so important to study these things and bring it to bear when necessary, when the spirit leads. We don't have this formula or this checklist like when the counselor, when the counselee says this, we then respond with predictive prophecy. I mean, that's not spirit led. We're not formulistic. We're not legalistic. We're not led by our own mind power. We're led by the Holy Spirit. So we know we're convinced we understand the rapture. We understand how important it is to know end times events. And if you don't know your Bible and you don't know these things, well, that's where you begin as a counselor because then you can't bring it to bear. You can't force it. You can't fake it and try to show people these things. But they're important in studying the book of Revelation and studying Bible prophecy in general. It's very important that you know these things so you can bring them to bear in the counseling office. Why? Number one, Studying Bible prophecy helps to me to remember and those I minister to to remember that God is in control of all the events in the world today. He is in control. And really, just forthrightly, things can be scary. The world can shake you up. You can look around and think, what in the world is going on with the way people are thinking? It's topsy-turvy. Right is declared as wrong. Wrong is declared as right. Uh, DNA and biology concerning the, you know, boys versus girls, and girls can now be boys, and boys can now be girls. It's upside down and no longer logical and doesn't make sense, even scientifically. And so we're saying, what's going on? What's going to happen with this? Prophecy would say God's in control. When you know eschatology, things are going according to schedule. Then all of a sudden, oh, that makes sense. This has to happen. This is happening on God's timeline. And it's a good reminder, God's in control of the world. But listen, God's control of your life, counselor, He's in charge and in control of all that goes on in your personal world of drama, your interpersonal relationship, your conflict resolution, your emotional ups and downs and confusions that are in life. But also as you're equipped, you're going to be then prepared to answer other people and say in their world that God is in control. You know, maybe something's happened in your life Lately, that doesn't make any sense. Tragedy has befallen you. There's some big shift in another area of life, maybe in your area of thinking. You're saying, what's going on? Where's God? Well, you say this, and this is people that are going to come to you, and oftentimes God allows that to happen to you so you'll have the empathy and, and um, compassion. I know in, when we're called to pray with intercessions for uh, kings and those that are in charge. It talks about a Greek word in prayer of intercession called entuxis. Look up that Greek word entuxis. And that word means to enter into prayer with empathy and understanding. Enter into a deep clarity of understanding. Like, yeah, I've gone through this too. And I'm praying with you with a a depth of understanding in prayer because I've battled the same battle you're battling in past and I have found victory. So I've in Tuxis, I've got on my knees and I've prayed with this person that's struggling, you know, and sometimes things you go through, I think, why am I going through this Lord? I'm going through this deep uh, season of darkness and these blues. I, I'm just, it's not like flicking a switch and I, I can't snap out of it and turn it off and I'm wrestling and I need to be, oh God, revive me according to your word and I'm not being revived and I'm just not able to see the light at the end of the tunnel and I know you're in control, but it just isn't helping me. And then God lifts that cloud and you're doing better and you're walking with the Lord and guess what he does? 
He crosses your path that somebody's going through that dark season of the soul and you can enter into prayer in Tuxis because you get it. You've been there. You found victory. Do you see how important it is to understand that times we're living in, but on the other hand, that God is in control. And when you've seen him in control of your own life and people are anxious and tripping, like an old word that I used to use back in the 80s on things, people are tripping on stuff, you know, that you can say, yeah, God's in control. Okay, number one, Bible prophecy reminds me God is in control. Number two, it gives you a heavenly perspective. So in the counseling office, we get the understanding that God's in control. Number two, we get a heavenly perspective. A lot of times we lose a heavenly perspective, an eternal perspective, especially in our day-to-day when things seem to be going well. But when you're in a time of difficulty, God is with you in a special way. And maybe it's just that you're more aware of him when things are going and spinning out of control. You're just hanging on more tightly because I got to hold on. Things are spinning around here pretty wild. And his strength can be made perfect in weakness. So we remind people about the end times reminds us to look up because I think that in our life right now, we can go through a whole day, a, a whole week without a single thought of heaven or thinking about eternal things. But you know, when you're laying on your back, when you're in a deep pit, when you're down and out, the only way you could look is up, look up your redemption draws near. And so we need a heavenly perspective and we need to be reminded of this fact. And that's your job as the biblical counselor is, Hey, listen, it's going to come to pass. This, this is going to be resolved and in short order because the next event, how much, listen to this, how much of the people that you minister to how many of their problems would not be resolved in the twinkling of an eye in the rapture? Boom, it's all done. And so we have this hope. And it's a simple heavenly perspective we can look up that we ask them, are you ready? It's an important thing. I mean, we could be laid out on our back at any time and it will affect the way you live. And the way you think, and then you'll begin to look up. But why don't we look up now? Because we believe, if you really believe Jesus Christ could come back at any time, it will affect your lifestyle. First John, listen to this. First John 1, uh, first John chapter 3, because or first John verse 3, because there's no chapters in first John. So first John verse 3 says, He that has this hope of the Lord's return purifies himself even as he is pure. Listen, he that has this hope, the blessed hope, the return of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church, the end times, when you have an eternal perspective of the Lord's return, you purify yourself just as he is pure. So if you understand Bible prophecy as you ought to, as you help those that you minister to understand it, it'll have a spiritual purifying effect, a positive effect on those lives. So I would put this as number three. Understanding and studying eschatology in the counseling office has three things it should do for you. Number one, it helps you remember God's in control. Number two, it gives you a heavenly perspective. Number three, it should uh, precipitate purity. I guess that's a good way to put it. It precipitates, you know, precipitation. It, it, it kind of brings about purity. If you understand Bible prophecy as you ought to, it would have a purifying effect. And one of the signs of the last days, according to scripture will be a renewed interest in Bible prophecy. Daniel chapter 12. Remember the prophet, he's totally disturbed. 
He doesn't understand what's going on. He can't wrap his mind around what he's writing, what God's inspiring him to write about the last days. What does all this mean? And the angel gave him these visions, responded, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Look, Daniel, you, Daniel, keep this prophecy wrapped up. Keep it a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end, because many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. In other words, the angel is saying, look, Daniel, you're not going to understand all of this. A lot of this isn't going to really happen in your lifetime, Dan, (laughs) Daniel. It's coming in the days ahead, in the last days, in the end of days, you know, when people are going to zip to and fro and here and there across the earth and knowledge will increase and that's when it's going to be rediscovered and understood and i believe that's when we're living now because we understand these things it's very clear to us we're living in the last days the final days a lot of things in the bible predicts that there are uh the things that are happening right before us it's predictive prophecy if there's no doubt about it we're living in the last days And so pray for me. God has put on my heart to write a book of the place of eschatology or the place of, I don't know, the position of the rapture in the biblical counseling movement in the counselor's office. So much can bring comfort. We're, the Bible says, to comfort one another with these words. We're not to be scared. We're to be prepared. It's to produce purity. It's to produce Hope, it's to cause us to look up. It's to give us an eternal perspective that, look, the rapture happens, everything's solved. Not that we're to go to one extreme or the other. You know, that's what people do. They flip out and they go to an extreme. That's your job as a biblical counselor is to keep your people from going one side or the other, the ditch of licenseness, licentiousness or the other ditch of legalism or the getting weird, you know, people will get really weird. Well, if the raptures happen, I can just do this or I can be that or I could be um, frivolous. That's not what it's about. It's about being pure, about being holy, about looking up, about knowing our redemption draws near, about being wise about, you know, living for Christ, but to die as gain and to not be scared, but to be prepared. I mean, there's a lot here that brings hope, that brings comfort. It's important. And because we are living in the last days, I see it like dominoes. You know, I mean, I used to play dominoes. They called it bones. I can't even remember how. To, I don't know the last time I played dominoes. I forgot how to play. I do know how to line them all up and knock them over a brrrp, and watch them fall. I think that's fun. That's kind of dominoes to me. But, you know, you you stack a bunch of dominoes right next to each other. You you, you stand them up and then you and you kind of put them in a curvy curve and then you knock the first one over and it hits the next one and the next one and the next one. And then it just it just goes and it doesn't stop. That's the prophetic events. How once the first one happens, the rapture, the others will happen in rapid succession. So if you're in the book of Revelation and you're looking at the tribulation, right after the rapture is spoken of in chapter four, the tribulation, the you know, the the trumpet judgments the bowls, the vials that are poured out. And then there's a Armageddon. And then there's the, uh, we come back with the Lord. First, we meet the Lord in the air. And then we come, uh, he comes for us. And then we come back with them. And we rule and reign for a thousand years in the millennial reign. And then there's a, you know, new heaven and new earth. And we live happily ever after. I mean, this is awesome that God's told us in advance but we see the Armageddon and the Antichrist and the tribulation. Uh, we see it casting a shadow in 2021. Those things are starting to really become clear. We're seeing the outline of the shadow and some of it being filled in. And we're like, wow, we're that close that we're like standing in the shadow of the tribulation. That means a rapture must be near. It's like, I love to say when you see 
uh, Walmart or Target or, you know, social media start to talk about Christmas, um, you know, you start to hear uh, Christmas th- themes and songs and decorations popping up and people talking about Christmas, all the advertisers and the commercialism. What do you know? Well, you know that Thanksgiving is near, right? You know the Thanksgiving, you're like, what? Thanksgiving, it's Christmas. Well, yeah, but they do it so early that we know, and that's kind of the way it is with uh, some of these things. We see them coming, we know the rapture's near. It's not signs of the rapture. It's more signs of the tribulation that's coming with the Antichrist rising up and these things that he'll be putting into place, the one world religion, the one world government, the one world monetary system. All of those kind of things that are uh, foreshadowed and coming, it says the rapture is near because we see that that's coming. We won't be here, by the way. We're going to be up, taken away, out of the way. We're not appointed to wrath. And these things are, once they happen, it's like a bunch of dominoes. And that's, it just happens in rapid succession. The next event on the prophetic calendar, no one can say with all certainty, but my biblically informed opinion, which happens to be right, by the way. I do believe it's right, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, I believe the next event of the prophetic calendar is what we call the rapture of the church. So what is the rapture of the church? We're almost done here. I'm running out of time, but I need to talk about this. I think it's important that you talk about these things and have this as one of your doctrines available to you as you uh, learn and know and grow in so that when you minister to somebody, God will use it. I promise you, God will use it at the right time, at the right place, if you're led by the Spirit. It's not a, when they say this, well, then you bring up the rapture. No, it's kind of led by the Spirit. You got to be walking in the Spirit. You got to have a walk and a talk and a fire with Jesus to be a good, you know, effective minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know everybody listening to this is that person, but I'm just here to remind you. I mean, Peter said that we're to remind one of these things. That's my job. I'm reminding you. And so then the rapture, some would say, well, there's no rapture in the Bible. Show me rapture in the Bible. Well, if you have a Latin version, it's rapturus. Uh, The Greek translation is harpazo. So it's there in the languages, harpazo, to be caught up by force, kind of be like God reaches down and grabs you by the collar and yanks you to heaven, kind of, so to speak, if you want a word picture. But that word is used repeatedly in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, an event where we're harpazoed or caught up suddenly to meet the Lord in the air. And it's referred to as the rapture because it's a, uh, from the Latin And it's where the Lord comes for his church. And on the heels of the rapture is this world leader. He's going to emerge on the scene, which I believe he is alive today, ready to be empowered by Satan himself. And he'll appear as a man of peace, a good guy, a sharp guy, probably a good looking guy. Then he'll reveal his true colors, and he's known as the beast or the Antichrist. And the tribulation period begins, lasts for seven years, begins peacefully, literally all hell breaks loose, culminating on the final battles to be fought in the Valley of Megiddo, known as the Battles of Armageddon. And during the Battle of Armageddon, Christ himself returns from heaven in glory, called the Second Coming, And we're not to confuse that with the rapture. The difference between the rapture and the second coming is two different events. The rapture is when Jesus Christ comes for his church, meets us in the air. And then in the second coming, he returns with us, with his church. In the rapture, it's in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. You can't measure it in human times. It's the second coming, though, in that scenario, every eye will see him. And I like to say, what goes up must come down, and we're going to go up to meet the Lord in the air. We'll be in heaven, 
worshiping for seven years, and we're going to return with the Lord in the second coming. And then Jesus establishes what's known as the millennial reign, called the millennia or the millennium, just means a thousand or a thousand year reign of Christ. He'll reign with righteousness, with the rod of iron, will rule and reign with him. And after that, the new Jerusalem, and we will be as as it were a bride adorned for her husband. We come from heaven to earth, and we rule and reign with the Lord. And that uh, those events, um, once the first one happens, like that domino, the others follow in rapid succession. And that's what we're uh, what we're waiting for. I can safely say that we've never been closer to the return of Jesus Christ than we are right now, and we need to be ready, and those we minister to should be ready. So what were the three things? This is very brief. I think I went over time. I totally went over time, but I needed to get this in that we're we're going to study this again someday, somewhere, somehow, When and pray for me. I want to write a book on this. I need your help. I need much prayer. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit because not everybody's going to agree with this controversial issue. I'm going to I'm going to stir a hornet's nest with the topic of the es- eschatological timetable where I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, the imminency of the return of Jesus Christ that it will remind us and those that we counsel that God's in control, that we're to look up our redemption draws near and that it should bring purity in our lives and that, you know, there's hope and we could, there's 10 more items that I want to talk about, but that's all for now. Love you guys. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. You can learn more at jeffchristensen.org. That's jeffchristensen.org. And be sure to share this podcast with a friend. Well, may the Lord richly bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.